Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this live streaming on my YouTube channel on a discussion on the Spectator Papers. And my discussion today is directed towards the uh, issue of the role of the spectator in the spectator papers. Now, the point remains, why is uh, the spectator so important? Or what is the role of the spectator? Why is the role of the spectator so important in the spectator papers? I'll begin by arguing that in his attempt to bring philosophy out of closets and libraries to dwell among clubs and coffee houses. Addison needed a character who could stand as an interface between himself and his audience, who could maintain a stance of neutrality, and who could combine wit and morality within his narration. It is with this intent that Addison created the figure of the spectator. The figure of the spectator goes back to the classical idea of the Eidolon, E-I-D-O-L-O-N. Eidolon, in the classical Roman sense, means both an idealized person or thing and a specter or a phantom. Now, the spectator is both, is both human and also stands for the neutral gaze. What do I mean? The spectator since is commenting on the discourse of news and contemporaneity, is a figure who squarely situates himself in the society of his period. He comments on his lineage. He establishes the fact that he is present in almost every public place. If you look at that essay, the first essay of the spectator, we find that he mentions that he is frequently seen in most public places, in a round of politicians, smoking a pipe at child's, committee of politics in the inner room, in Haymarket and Drury Lane Theatre, is there as a merchant in the exchange, and even passes as a Jew in the assembly of stock jobbers at Jonathan's. Therefore, very interestingly, therefore, the spectator is almost a ghost, is an individual who is there in almost every single location that the public sphere engages in. At the same time, he's a present absence who is like a ghost who's never, who's always there, but not visible, primarily because the spectator serves the purpose of a narrative function again, the gazer. He is the medium through which Addison, the essayist, gazes on society. And this gaze is, as it were, only present across the entire gamut of society. It is this first role of the spectator as the idolon that becomes crucial in the, the practice of writing the spectator papers. <clears throat> the second point that I wish to make is that for the spectator papers to create a civil public sphere, 
it is important to maintain an aura of a strict neutrality. And that is what the spectator professes, that even though he belongs, as he squarely states, to the realm of the landed gentry, and he talks about his ancient lineage, he is referring to his own status also as somebody who can be neutral between the Whig Sir Roger de Coverley and I'm sorry, the, the Whig Sir Andrew and the Tory Sir Roger de Coverley. He can be neutral between the knight, the landed gentry and the merchant class. He can also be a neutral between the country and the city. Therefore, the spectator's personality allows him the capacity to gaze and roam. So it's a, it's a gaze that is not static. You will find that the characters in the spectator papers are largely located within their own ambits. It is the spectator who moves. So the spectator is the surrogate narrator. And yet, the narrator does not reveal himself. He reveals himself through a medium, this spectre-like spectator who can, uh, who can move around society without attracting any attention. The other point that all of you also have noticed probably when we discussed the essay is the silence of the spectator. Now, he's, he's not silent when it comes to writing, of course, he's voluminous in his writing. But even as a child, the spectator is seen not to shake his rattle. And he defines himself in the essay by his taciturnity. Right. And his only intention is to print himself out before he dies. Now, there are certain key words which Addison uses. Obscurity is one, neutrality is the other, and silence or taciturnity is the third. The spectator's character is marked by his refusal to speak in public. So he lives, as it were, as a listener and a viewer of society. And he seldom makes his own presence felt. But does this hold true when Addison sort of uh, refers to his own uh, sort of essays? You see, in the essays, we see a different kind of a spectator. A spectator who continuously keeps on sort of narrating event after event and then addressing and unobtrusively entering the essays through a narrative caveat. For example, as we have already seen in Ghosts and Superstitions, there's the story about the elms and the kind of visitations that are made in the ghost house, ghosted house rather, in how Sir Roger sort of asks his chaplain to sit and sleep in every room of the haunted house and thereafter exorcises the ghost. And then comes the speaking eye of the spectator. And it, you see, this eye is a very important concept. It is both the alphabet I as well as the word E-Y-E. -E. Now, the speaking I in this case makes certain very important points. He is the one who is delivering the moral of the spectator papers, as it were. At the same time, the I is also very important because the first person speaking voice always provides a degree of authenticity to the essays. Remember, 
they are enmeshed in the discourse of contemporaneity. They're enmeshed in the discourse of news. So Addison, when he says through the spectator, I am a participant in this, is actually situating himself through the spectator and giving the spectator papers a greater degree of authenticity. Now, this is also something that Defoe does in almost all his novels, remember. If you look at Moll Flanders or, for that matter, Robinson Crusoe, Defoe's speaking voice is always the I, the first person defining voice. At the same time, this speaking I is again silent, right? He does not, he is not engaged in social intercourse. Therefore, the speaking eye is also the observing kind of omniscient E-Y-E-I, right? Who gazes on society. So can we say, therefore, that in the figure of the spectator, Addison is actually combining, <coughs> combining the first person authentic voice of narration and the third person omniscient voice of narration. It's a very sophisticated narrative technique whereby Addison achieves a balance between the authenticity of the first person narrative and the omniscience of the third person narrative. Now, the other aspect that, of course, you have noticed is that because of his strict neutrality, it then becomes possible for Addison to use a range of narrative devices. Now, what are the range of narrative devices that he uses? The first is, of course, this careful attention to social detail. The careful attention to social detail. Now, take the essay on Moll White, for example. Addison then can talk about the hovel in which he visits, the decrepit condition of the old woman, a degeneration into poverty. <coughs> so minute observation of empirical details is something that this technique provides him with. The second is, you know, the ability to be present almost at all places. Now, obviously, you will understand that like Almost all the characters in the spectator club, right? Like all characters in the spectator club, the spectator also leads a life of leisure. The only, the only exception to this is, of course, Sir Andrew Freeport, right? Who is a practicing merchant in his own right. But all the other characters, as it were, lead a life of leisure. So the spectator is there for free to rove around in society. Now, many of my students will immediately be thinking about the kind of spectator whom we'll see in the modern period, the urban flaneur, as it were. But there's a crucial difference here. The spectator is not the disinterested spectator of the urban flaneur in that sense. He is much more engaged in society, right? You have to understand this clear difference. And secondly, the spectator has a definite purpose within society. In essay after essay, the spectator not only observes, but he also comments. He also not only does he represent the public sphere, he also formulates public opinion. It is therefore that 
essay number 10 becomes so crucial because his intention is very made clear, you know, sort of bringing philosophy out of closets and libraries. And he is asking in that essay, like an invocation to an epic almost, that he can, through his writings, recover the people from the state of vice and folly into which they have fallen. So these small doses of morality mixed with pleasure are therefore seen as almost medicinal in the way it can reform society, right? So that is another very important aspect of the spectator, that the spectator is also seeing himself as a kind of a social reformer, a silent social reformer whose weapon remains the pen and that virtual social space, public sphere that opens up with print, right? So the spectator is very much a creature of print, but he's also seeing himself not only as an observer, but also as a valid and ardent social reformer, so much so that the essays are not just reflections in the public sphere, but actually interventions in forming and shaping public opinion. It is here, therefore, that I would say that the role of the spectator becomes almost prophetic in the essays. Now, a century later, almost a century later, more than a century later, Shelley would be talking about the poet as the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Right. Now, it's very ironic. It's not ironic, really, but you see, Shelley is seeing the or looking at the poet as a kind of a person who brings in a revolution in society. Now, Addison is also seeing himself in the same light. And he says through the spectator that it is through these essays that the spectator will bring a kind of social revolution, transform public taste and public opinion, and bring the emergence of civil society. This brings me to another point here, is the spectator's ability to mix with people, talk to them, listen to them, and know their viewpoints. Right. So this idea of a, of a civil society where there is a mediator who can allow the space for them to talk and then talk to them through social print is something that the spectator is bringing to the essays. Now, the question which many of you have, could have asked is why not, you know, just simply Addison. Addison could have said, I am Joseph Addison or I am Joseph Addison and Steele. And therefore, I am writing the, the essays. Now, once again, the other feature that you must have observed is that the spectator is also marked by a participatory phenomenon. So it's not just a narrator and a writer. It's equally somebody who is engaged in interactive journalism, in articulating or communicating with his with his readers. And this offers, therefore, Addison a kind of a buffer, right? That he's not made the direct recipients of the letters, but he becomes a kind of, the spectator becomes the kind of a buffer to whom the addresses are made, to whom the letters are addressed. And out of these letters, Addison can then proceed to choose important subjects of his latter essays and then compose these essays. Now, that's a lot of things, isn't it? The spectator is being kind of a, a kind of an eidolon, a kind of a spectator, a, a kind of a specter or a ghost, a intermediary, go between somebody who's both the first person and a third person as well. Somebody who sees himself as a participant of society outside it, 
somebody who sees himself as a revolutionary in society who can bring and transform uh, the opinions of the public and create a civil society and also interact and act and as a buffer between the author and his audience. Now, this becomes intensely crucial for us in understanding how the spectator, and see, see, we've talked about what the spectator does, where he comes from. Of course, I should have mentioned here that this first person narrativity in, in Addison and Steele is not unique to them, that Defoe had already tried that in the review. And of course, it will be used later on by uh, Fielding and Defoe. But my point here is what does actually the, the spectator do to English narrative prose and this kind of a, of a figure of the intermediate? <coughs> now, think about a novel which will be written almost uh, you know, 10 years down the line, right? Mall Flanders, where Defoe, as it were, engages in an act of what I will call narrative transvestism, right? Where Defoe will pretend to be a woman and articulate her feelings. You see, this concept of a kind of a negative capability of entering into another's consciousness and articulating it. I think the spectator becomes a very important figure in bringing this aspect into narrative prose during the 18th century. I think this is a very important phenomenon that the spectator is doing. Therefore, this narrative complexity of the spectator is this uh, addition to the dimension of the novel. At the same time, I think what the spectator is also bringing in is a kind of a prose. This very sense of intimacy, yet critical distance. This sense of authenticity, yet a certain amount of dispassionate moralization. So I would ideally suggest that the spectator is a kind of an intermediate figure. If you look at the history of prose narrators in English literature, you will find that there is in the, during the 18th century, this narrator of the sermon who is distanced and moralizing. We'll see this in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, who is not really human in that sense of the term, who, who seems to be existing and preaching from the pulpit. There's, of course, once again, the narrator of the criminal autobiography or the whore autobiography or the diary, who is very intimate, right? Who, who is marked by his by the lack of distance between the author and the reader, right? The spectator is squarely in between. He is sort of seeking the confidence of the reader to believe him, to believe in his authenticity. They were trying to bridge this distance. At the same time, you see, it allows Addison the author to generate a fair amount of distance between himself and the reader, right? So Addison's narrative technique at once also brings the common reader close to him, right? Because of the middle style, which we'll be talking about later on. At the same time, whenever you know, in the last part of the essays, whenever the moralizing starts or the messaging starts, immediately a critical distance is opened up. And there you can see 
the true aim of the spectator paper in morality first and then wit or entertainment and pleasure later on. Now, what is my point here, therefore? My point here is that in the spectator papers, Addison has created a very sophisticated narrative interlocutor. He's taken it from the classical idea of the idolon. He's brought in the intimacy of the first person narrator who is a participant in society. At the same time, he has defined this narrator by his silent participation so that he becomes more of an observer of mankind and somebody who is always slightly distanced from it. Therefore, he exists in that liminal state of or an intermediary space of the first person authenticity and third person omniscience. This allows him a critical distance to move freely between narrative intimate interaction with Sir Roger as well as the ironic humorous criticism of Sir Roger as well as the more direct moral messages passed to society about corruption, superstition, and so on and so forth. At the same time, this, you know, sort of oscillation in critical distance allows him both a distance with the reader as well as an intimacy with the reader, which comes in handy for the participatory sort of aspect of the spectator papers. The spectator, of, of course, as we'll have to acknowledge, acts as a kind of a bridge. He's the figure who links the 555 essays together. He is the bridge who links the spectator club, right? So the club, which consists of all these members, he's the one who has this interface with Sir Roger and Sir Andrew. He's the one to whom, if you remember, Sir Roger's butler writes to after Sir Roger has passed away. So the spectator remains a kind of a bridge. The spectator also remains a kind of a bridge between the country and the city, the Whig and the Tory, the Catholic and the Protestant, and the landed gentry and the merchant class. Therefore, the spectator's role is to observe the public sphere and also, in a certain way, to be the kind of an arbiter within this concept of civil society. Much has been made, of course, about Sainsbury's concept of the peace of the Augustan age. Sainsbury, in his very famous book, talked about the peace of the Augustans. But please remember that the Augustan age was not really a very peaceful age. There existed very many differences on very many counts. But this, it is with the spectator that Addison is seeking a presence that can, you know, sort of act as a kind of a bond with his, once again, I quote that line, his strict neutrality is very cultured presence. Also important, yes, this is something which I should have mentioned earlier, is that the spectator right in the middle of the essay talks about his learning. He talks about his travels to various parts. He talks about his travels to various parts of the country as well, as well as across the continent. So the spectator builds himself up also, not only as somebody who can observe 
but who can therefore legitimately comment on cultured society, right? on theater, for example, on the opera, for example, on Mr. Locke, whom he refers to by name in, in the essays, for example. So the spectator is a well-read man. And therefore, Addison is creating a character who has the moral as well as the kind of ac academic uh, uh, sort of uh, legitimacy to be an arbiter and a commentator on the public sphere, right? Therefore, the spectator therefore has a very clear middle, upper middle class uh, kind of an allegiance. And in certain ways, his narrative voice is in many cases patronizing towards women. It is marked by his class interests in the way that he sort of looks at the poor, is, is sympathetic towards them. But in many cases, the spectator is the one who maintains the status quo. So all in all, therefore, and since I've made a lot of points here, let me wind up by suggesting that at this particular juncture in English, in the history of English prose, Addison required a personality which would bring or bridge the immediacy of news with the distance of criticism, with could bridge the different classes of society and speak in a cultured tone, could also be both intimate and distanced with the reader. The spectator is borrowed. The notion of the spectator is borrowed from classical prose. But the presence of the spectator becomes vital in the subsequent sort of proceedings or the subsequent development of the novel. It is therefore that I'm going to argue that the spectator remains an extremely important intervention and a very important milestone in the development of not only the periodical essay, but also in the development of the English prose of the 18th century. The last such impact, I think, would have happened with the essays of Francis, Sir Francis Bacon. And the next major intervention will take place in the way in which Charles Lamb will be directing his own essays. It is with these words, therefore, that I'd like to conclude this lecture. And my next lecture will discuss the role of or the character of Sir Roger. And subsequently, I will be talking about the presence of the middle style in Addison. But that remains to be discussed on a separate day. As for today, thank you for your patience and for listening in to this presentation. It's with these words that I'm ending this live broadcast right now.